Bingo. <laughs> We're back with the Department of Health. We want to be healthy, not only individually, but as a community, you know. Uh, Sarah Park is our guest today, my co-host, Keisha King. Sarah yeah. Park is, can I, can I say this, the state epidemiologist? Oh, very good. Yeah, not bad, you know. Good. Yeah, you got to study that word. Yes, you do. <laughs> Sarah, what is an epidemiologist? <laughs> well, so I should start and say it's not tied to a specific uh, subject matter in that a lot of people, because of my role and what I do, they tend to think it's epidemiologist only works on infectious disease issues. But an ep epidemiologist basically just studies disease trends, um, how those conditions are um, impacted in the population, um, you know, and, and in individuals and how the differences um, occur in individuals, why they occur in particular individuals, and, but not in others. It's basically understanding what's going on, you know, with those diseases. It's not particular to infectious disease. It, there are chronic disease epidemiologists. There are environmental health epidemiologists, maternal child health. I just tend to focus on infectious disease. Okay. But it sounds to me like epidemiology is only one of your roles, too. Yeah, true. You do other things as well yeah. in our state. Yeah. So we're here to talk about, what are we here to talk about, Keisha? Today we're going to talk about rat lungworm disease. We're going to talk about okay. why it's here, why we're seeing so many cases here in Hawaii. Well, it's not so many cases, but it's more cases definitely than we'd like to see. I remember when this first came up, and it was in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. I called it the ought years. Yeah, we don't know what to call those years. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they were a dark hole. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is a dark hole, too, this one, this decade. Um, anyway, so, so here we are, and it's the early 2000s, and some cases come up on the Big Island, mm -hmm. and you know we're all kind of shocked by how this disease progresses. And, and, uh, and it's kind of a Hawaii-specific kind of disease, isn't it? We, we have a, more than our fair share. Uh, Hawaii-specific compared with the rest of the United States, yes, but not Hawaii-specific compared with the rest of the world. Yeah. In the South Pacific and the um, sort of Southeast Asian and Asian, um, Southern Asian areas, um, those countries or regions, they've definitely seen um, rat lungworm or angiostrongyliasis um, much more frequently than we have. Mm. Um, you know, they have uh, probably a greater risk factor in certain cultural aspects, you know, in that they, they're in, it's in their culture, actually, some of them to eat raw snails or, you know, undercooked snails and, and such as part of their diet. And so that's how they get more readily exposed in some cases. But yeah, it's not something we like to see here in Hawaii. No. Um, unfortunately, we are endemic for it. Um, uh, probably came over um, via either the slugs or snails being brought, brought over or the um, the rats, infected rats came over. No one's really clear how but it which, came which over. Which one brought it? Which is the vector, yeah. the original vector? Right. Yeah. But it most likely was introduced to Hawaii, so you could call it an invasive species. You know you know what I like about rat worm? There's not too much to like about rat lungworm. I can't no. find a single but thing. But there's one thing is if I had rat lungworm, I could not pass it directly to you. No. I could not do that. It's not a person-to-person. So it's not person. really infectious. No, it's not infectious in the sense that it's not a person-to-person -person infection. It has to be um, consumed. Um, you know, So you have to accidentally or intentionally, and as we've seen in some cases, um, surprisingly, um, uh, it, consume either an infected snail or a slug or other, there are a few other potentially, um, they call peritonic hosts, but generally speaking, we're talking about slugs or snails. And if you ate a rat, you, you'd be at risk. Mm, no, not necessarily. Because, snails are worse than rats. Then. Right, because rats are generally, um, they're infected with a different stage of the parasite. Um, so the parasite goes through various stages of its life cycle. And the stage it's in in the slug or snail is a stage that's perfect for us to get infected, whereas the stage it's in in the rat, not necessarily so. So I think most people are not going to be eating rats where they're obviously no, they infected no. with parasites, no. worms. You know, and you'd these probably would probably take worms away the green rats. pass in the restaurant. Yeah. They were serving rats. I think most people would be turning up their noses and be a little bit uh, wary of any place that had rats around in their um, eating establishment. But so it's a circle, it's a cycle, in all right? Seriousness, yeah. And it's, the cycle is between humans mm -hmm. um, and rats. And, well, so and, it's not between humans. Humans, we fall into the life cycle. So the life cycle we're not is. part of it. We're not part of the life cycle. The regular life cycle is slugs, snails, or mollusks, um, and rats, and they go on this current, you know, constant cycling around where rats are the definitive hosts. 
What, what we mean by definitive host is that's where the parasite reproduces itself. Whereas a slug or snail is what we call an intermediate host. They just sort of carry one stage of the parasite, but the parasite actually can't reproduce in the snail or slug. So if you imagine, you could, if we ever by any miracle eliminated all mollusks, we could potentially affect the life cycle to a certain extent. But more, effect, more effective would be to get rid of rats uh, or to limit or control the population of rats because, mm. as I said, they're the definitive host. Cut out the cycle that they're way. They're the ones that the parasite reproduces constantly in. So if you cut out that ability to reproduce itself, yeah. you, know, you control the rats, then you can control the potential for us to get infected. We fall into that life cycle because slugs or snails, any one of us who lives in Hawaii knows you know, in the morning, in the in the early evening, you've seen the snail trails, the slug sure. trails, right? And if you've got a home garden or even just any vegetation, you see those slugs or snails going into the leaves and getting into the crevices. Or, you know, even around your property, if you happen to have like an, a pail or a, something that's overturned and making a nice dark sort of sh shade with maybe a little moisture underneath, you overturn that, even some tarp, right? If you overturn those, you'll find plenty of these slugs or snails. But where I was going with the home garden and such is that well, slugs or snails. Part. Well, you're, not the slime, the slugs or snails. We have to talk about the slime because sure. I have a reference to Ghostbusters, the movie, okay. when they said, I'm, oh, I've been slimed. Okay, but it's no, more serious it's than It's the slug or snail. So the tissue of these slugs or snails are just totally teeming, can be teeming with this parasite. We accidentally ingest it. If we didn't wash our lettuce or... Are, these days, a lot of people are into kale, and you imagine, so when you wash your lettuce, your, your head of lettuce, when you get it home um, from the farmer's market or you grew it in your backyard, do you take it apart leaf by leaf and inspect it? Because that's what we recommend in the state of Hawaii, is that if you're home, you have homegrown vegetation, you should be inspecting that leaf, the, especially the leafy greens, leaf by leaf, and rinsing it with your hands yeah. mechanically. Being natural and organic leaf leaf. is not the way to go. Well, it, it can be. I'm, we're still saying healthy greens are healthy for well, you, yeah, but, but I mean, you just to need to be it, careful. Out of the ground, not clean it. I mean, that's A what happened people, in, the, in the ought years. They, yeah. would, they would grow it in the backyard, and, uh, and sure. then they wouldn't clean it right, and, and then they would eat it and bingo. A lot of people, their practice, uh, when we've interviewed folks, um, we find that a lot of people just run and take the head of lettuce or a few leaves and they put it under running water, shake it off, and then put it on the counter or, you know, or on the cutting board and proceed to make their salad or whatnot. But um, we've also found that by doing that, you could potentially miss, you know, some of the slugs or stales well, that here's my big have question, been, um, Sarah. crawled big, into those corners. Big question. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about what big question I would ask you. This is a big question. Okay. Okay. I go into a restaurant and I order a salad. Mm -hmm. This is not unusual or remarkable because that's mostly what I order. Salad. So do I. Yeah. Okay. It shows on you. It doesn't show on me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. How do I know that the people who have prepared that salad mm -hmm. are doing the right thing? They, in any restaurant in this state, <clears throat> there could be somebody who doesn't do the right thing. In. And sure. so it's not a matter of looking, you know, at the, at the, uh, at the, you know, the small towns on the Big Island or anything like that. It could be anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So our, the risk is here in the state of Hawaii, and it's all about, it's not necessarily homegrown or whatnot. We're finding also likely... There's suggestion that it's also how you store your food. So um, as far as eating establishments, you know, you mentioned that the placard uh, system that our environmental health colleagues in the department have instituted several years ago. Um, and so that is one way to be assured that our eating establishments are following the code, food code correctly, you know, making sure that things are handled appropriately. It's hygiene. anecdotal, though. I'm sorry? The inspector goes in. Mm -hmm. He makes sure that at that moment in time, mm -hmm. and he may have a surprise inspection, mm -hmm. I know that. Sure. But at that moment in time, everybody's doing it right. Mm -hmm. But then next day, maybe somebody Well, there's always do that right. risk, right? But yeah. um, I think many of the establishments, I mean, this is their reputation. If it word gets out about something, their, their reputation oh, is down to the downstairs end of that restaurant. That's the end of their business, right? Yeah. Exactly. So there's, you know, nothing is 100%. But it is a means to have some reassurance that people are acting accordingly in the eating establishment. The other thing to think about is that we're not talking about produce from the mainland. You know, and um, the amount of produce that is required to uh, supply these establishments, a lot of them are getting their supplies or most of them are getting them from the mainland. Now, there is a farm-to-table movement where there's local produce, 
But what we've seen is that a lot of these eating establishments, I mean, they're very well aware of this risk factor as well as a lot more common foodborne diseases like E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, and such. And so they're taking pains to make sure the produce that they serve is well washed, you know, go through several rinses and such and um, before they actually serve, you know. And again, it's their reputation. It's not just that someone is, becomes ill. Can you imagine that you're in an eating establishment and someone says, waiter, I've got a slug in my snail. The word's going to get, yeah, everyone's, it's not just Bye. the disease, it's the fact that there was something in this salad that can cause an issue for the reputation. So, um, so these are things that I'm sure many of the eating establishments in our state consider. So what now, I get out of this is that if you knock off the rats mm -hmm. and you don't fool around with snails, you mm -hmm. just don't fool around with or snails. Or slugs. Or slugs. Or slime. Well. Or slugs. Slug slime, snail slime, right? It, it, That's it, more it, a precaution, but it's not been proven that the slime is oh, actually... Okay. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Right. Okay. Um, so if you, you know, knock off the rats, don't deal with snails or, or slugs, um, and you, you watch out in restaurants for the green pass sign, because that, that helps to reduce the risk. You're, you're, you're reasonably sure that you're not going to get this disease. Right, reasonably uh, sure. Reasonably right. sure. And I can't you, guarantee anything 100%. If you don't go to restaurants and you go to a food a market that only has... You go to a food stand on the side of the road where there's no placard and there's no running water and you don't know what the food source is and they're serving kale smoothies and such, I would not order those. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, so I'd want to make sure, I'd want to actually see them hand washing everything before I actually ate it, you know. Um, so those are the establishments that, you know, you have to be a little bit more questioning of. I know there are people, um, especially our visitors, like to think it's quaint, the roadside stand and things like this. This is not the place no. to be quaint. No, and, and, and it's your body, it's your health. Right. So I know what you're burning to ask, Keisha. Oh, please tell us, what am I burning to yeah, ask? I know you're burning to ask. So if I get it, and there's not that many cases in Hawaii, but three, I think, this year total? Uh, you know, I, honestly, I'd have to look at the latest Less than counts, one hand. But Less than that's, one I, hand. that's the residents. We have some non-resident cases, too. Oh, you my know. goodness. Okay. So, so if I get it, um, two, two questions that mm -hmm. I'm sure you're going to ask. Indeed. One is, what happens to me? And two is, what can I do about it, comma, if anything? I hear you asking that. That is my question. I did want to know what the symptoms are, because from what I read, it does seem as though the symptoms are much like the flu um, initially. Sort of. Not really, actually. The flu, remember, is a respiratory infection, and so mm -hmm. you're going to have coughing and sneezing. That's mm -hmm. not part of rat lung worm a okay. disease or androstorgalitis. Headache and body ache, though. Headache. Um, yeah. Body ache is not the same as the kind of body aches you get with the flu, necessarily. Okay. So. If you think about it, the way this um, worm causes, um, causes symptoms is that it's, it's, it likes to go to your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, when it invades our body, it get, we accidentally ingest it, it gets into our bloodstream, and it travels to our central nervous system. And, and there is no, um, uh, there's no sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, no, no specific area that they're really targeting in your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so it can go anywhere. It's just basically find, trying to find its home, and we're not it. Mm -hmm. So it keeps moving around until it dies, because it will die in us because we're not their home. We can't provide it what it needs to survive. But while it's alive and it's moving, that's what's causing damage. The physical, actual damage it's causing as it migrates as well it's a growing as, size. Right. Well, no, no. But it's, it's like a having, I've said this before to others, it's like having a slow-moving bullet moving around your central nervous system. Plus, it's because it's foreign to our body. Our body is recognizing it's foreign. There's this huge inflama inflammatory response, so a lot of inflammation, swelling, and such. So mm -hmm. those two things, that physical movement plus the inflammation combined, are what's causing the symptoms. Now, where it migrates to in your, in your central nervous system is what dictates in terms of the specific symptoms that you might get. But some people complain of having um, odd skin sensations, tingling, burning sensation in their skin. Other people have weakness in their limbs. Other people have facial, what we call facial palsies. Um, they all have headache, though, because that inflammation, that, you know, there's blockage going on. Is this on hard to diagnose? Is it hard to test? 
Do it's, doctors in the state of Hawaii know how what it looks like when, when it's... Well, I'm hope, we're all constantly hoping that more and more of them do know. And I think the, those doctors who are, and other healthcare providers who are, um, who practice in Hawaii regularly, um, I, I like to think most of them by now have at least heard about the disease and know where to call if they need help. Um, I think our challenge at, at times are those temporary doctors and nurses, so to speak, the temporary healthcare providers that fill in sometimes um, when there's a shortage in a healthcare facility or someone's on vacation or, you know, you see this a lot in the emergency department sometimes, some of our neighbor island hospitals. Because sometimes. there's not that much of it. There's, it's slightly we have exotic. Providers it's an exotic shortage, disease. Right? Yeah. right. It's not something that they're familiar with on the mainland. A lot of them are coming from the mainland, remember, and they're not going to be familiar with this. So it's a constant challenge to try and educate those healthcare providers, not just doctors, but nurses and other folks who are, you know, in the, the traveling doctors, shall we call them, and traveling nurses, right? Making sure that they're aware. Um, so that leaves it to the individuals to it be does, sure. It does. It, well, it does to a certain extent. But, you know, on our part in the Department of Health, we try to make sure that there's a website that has a lot of information that um, is available for the public, but also for healthcare providers to reference. Um, there is now a, a clinical work group um, uh, that's a subgroup of the um, governor's task force, of which I'm a part of as well. Um, and uh, we as clinicians are getting together to try and uh, we've already developed preliminary guidelines and we provide a link to that preliminary clinical guidelines um, for doctors and nurses and such um, on our website. Um, the clinical work group is working on a, uh, you know, a, a final um, guideline that um, a more complete guideline for healthcare providers. So these are all tools to help to the healthcare provider mm -hmm. in terms of recognizing and management. Management. Um, that's the that's the question you have to ask it. The big yeah. thing though is the headache. You know, and it's a severe enough headache that a lot of healthcare providers, uh, physicians, will consider the diagnosis of meningitis mm -hmm. because it's that severe. It's not just headache, stiffness in the neck. You mm -hmm. know. Um, various other things that would sort of clue in to a healthcare provider that there's something more than just a regular headache. Mm -hmm. And that usually triggers to do a, what we call a lumbar puncture, to collect cerebral spinal fluid. Now that sc sounds scary to the average yeah, person, but it's actually a routine part of a diagnostic workup if you're thinking about something neurological, and it can offer a lot of information. So you take the spinal fluid and you, you look, and you can fluid, see it under a microscope. A, you can't see the parasite. I'm, probably like rarely see the parasite because the parasite really doesn't hang out in the in that fluid the, that's bathing your brain and your spinal cord so there, what it's will hanging you out in the brain if you're what you'll back. see is cells white blood cells that mm -hmm. fight infection right mm -hmm. in our body there's a particular type of white blood cell called eosinophils and those start getting produced in large numbers when we have this parasitic infection it can be produced in response to other things, but in the state of Hawaii, when we have CSF or lumbar puncture fluid, where you have this case of a um, person with severe headache and potentially other neurological findings, and now you see in that CSF that the eosinophil level is high, that they have white blood cells and it's predominantly eosinophils. That's a huge, you know, ding, 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 you know, this, this is probably going to be so antistotalysis. And it sounds, no, I'm makes a wild guess. I like to make wild guess. <clears throat> so, so we know that, um, that it's going to create an inflammatory reaction. Mm -hmm. We also know, I think I heard you say, that after a while it doesn't find a home and it's got nowhere to go and it burns right. itself out. Right. So the idea is to wait it out and avoid well, the, manage the inflammation right. while we're waiting it out. Is this right. right? So there's a spectrum, like all infectious diseases, there's a spectrum of clinical presentation or disease, right? symptoms. And so some people are going to be lucky enough to have mild symptoms, mild being severe headache, which some people would argue is not mild. Um, and then others are going to have more sort of complications and neurological symptoms and such that last for a few weeks or longer. And others, unfortunately, very few, but there are going to be some, unfortunately, will have severe disease, um, even as severe as coma and even a couple instances of death. Now, this is why it's so important that they're under medical care, that a physician is following them, is checking their labs, um, potentially treating them. The, the preliminary guidelines that I mentioned earlier, we've recommended that clinicians should consider in these patients um, providing steroid therapy. As long as they've excluded Managing all the other... Right. As long as they've excluded all other infectious disease causes, because you never want to give steroids to someone who has like a bacterial infection. Because if you do that, they're gonna, you're just going to make things worse. So you have to first exclude all the other potential causes of infection. 
um, then you're pretty sure that you have this, uh, this parasitic infection. The treatment right now of recommending is steroid therapy, high dose steroids for at least a couple of weeks and monitoring while on those steroids because if you're on high dose steroids, if you're diabetic, that could be a problem because it throws your sugars off, for example. Um, and then there is a potential to just, you know, that we're actually discussing right now, the clinical work group is discussing about the utility of using uh, anti-parasitic um, medication. And the jury is really out. The research that's been done, and there's very limited research out there because they're, it's not like this is so common. That would common be experimental that, at this point. Yeah, so we're, what's definitive, we definitely say steroid therapy, plus or minus the, um, what we call anti-helminths or anti-parasitic drugs. Um, and monitoring the patient, very important. Now, to, to back up to the diagnosis, so simple rule of thumb is, as I mentioned, that cerebral spinal fluid. But please also report to the state of Hawaii, because then what we can do is help to do what we call a, a PCR test, a polymerase um, a chain reaction test. And that's to look for the DNA of this parasite in the CSF. Mm. Now, and you can do most, some testing on that, some, maybe even solve it. Right. So the, it, just to give definitive diagnosis. Most yeah. of the time, like I said, if you have a patient with all the clinical symptoms, they've been in Hawaii, they've now got eosinophils in their CSF, greater than 10% eosinophils, that's pretty much likelihood this is this, is this parasitic infection because mm. we don't really have other conditions that will I, cause that picture. Ideally, somebody even here in Japsum, you know, when, could they talk about these DNA things? finds a way to neutralize, you know, the worm. I find well, a way to nice. do that. That would be nice. And we would be famous here in Hawaii yeah. if we solved this problem. Um, Not just for this parasite, but many other, I mean, there are many cousins of this parasite that cause problems in other parts yeah. of the world. So that would be an amazing um, find if you could figure that out. If you manage, manage it, this is my last question before I ask you to take a break. <laughs> if you manage it, <clears throat> and now you don't have such an inflammatory reaction, and your body's immune system is dealing properly, however that might be. And uh, the parasite is like, you know, not finding a home. It's, it's getting it dies. tired. It dies. Can it come back? No, it cannot come back. Once it's dead, it's dead. So at some point, people will recover if you're going to recover, except, as I mentioned, the few that might go on to more severe disease. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you may recover from the infection, but you could have long-term complications because, again, it's, it's, your moving through your, exactly, it's moving through your central nervous system causing damage. Yeah. So if it caused some irreparable damage, you're going to have to recover, rehabilitate from that, oh. if at all possible. So this there are other long-term potential not effects. A happy thing. You know, and, and I, my neurological system, I just suggest that we take a break. We don't have time for a break. No. We're going to go sure right into it. So. But we have to make it clear to our audience that we've been talking about rat lungworm with Sarah Park, state epidemiologist and more. And we're going to stop talking about rat lungworm. Now we're going to talk about measles. Mm -hmm. Make a note. This is going to be on the final exam. Measles. This is the measles part. Mm -hmm. Measles. Let me just open the discussion by saying, you know, this thing about anti-vax, is so ridiculous mm. that it's like sliding back into the 12th century. Mm -hmm. I do not understand for a moment why responsible institutions actually encourage this. And yet they do. Even here, even in Hawaii, nay, you should go out with a baseball bat and fix this. <laughs> I don't know if that's the appropriate response. Um, and I'm not sure which institutions are actually supporting. I hope not. Um, sure. But uh, because we're... Generally, it's not a good idea to support pseudoscience. Um, you know, the d data is clear. You know, measles is a severe disease. I think this, in this day and age, our population is healthier. So, okay, one could argue we're a healthier population. We get hit with measles. Maybe not as bad, you know, severity-wise compared with, you know, early 1900s or, you know, late 1800s where nutrition was always, you know, potentially a challenging issue for a large part of the population other issues in terms of, you know, not as well protected against other diseases and such. Am I right but, to say that in, measles is in, a, in a comparative analysis, if you have a lot of childhood diseases out there, although this isn't really limited to childhood, if you have a lot of childhood diseases out there, and some of them are really bad, some mm -hmm. are fatal, even childhood diseases. And measles can be fatal. Measles can be fatal, but, you know, in, in years past, 50 years ago, 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago, Measles was among an array of things, uh -huh. and it actually was not the, the worst kid on the block. Smallpox was, yeah. right. Or uh, the uh, neurological thing, in, uh, I forget the name of it, you know, 
where you get an infection in your, in your nervous system. Um, Which one? <laughs> well, I forget. Because measles matter. can do that too. <laughs> yeah, measles can do that too. So uh, all I'm saying is that now we beat back most of those other ones. Right, and thanks to vaccines. And measles stands alone, and it is quite serious. It is serious not, on an in, not only on an individual basis, but on an epidemiological basis. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you are so terribly inconsiderate. If you allow your kid... Oh, I thought you were telling me I'm inconsiderate. <laughs> no, i make my point. Okay. You are very inconsiderate to the community. If you care at all about the community, you have your kid vaccinated. Right. It's not only him, it's everyone in school. Or, I uh, would you know. actually just correct you and say measles doesn't stand alone. What is um, interesting about measles and what makes measles stand out is it's because it's so communicable, so infectious, that it... it it is essentially sort of the beacon of all these other infectious diseases coming back. It basically shows us if this most infectious of all the diseases that we're vaccinated against right now is coming back now, it's an indicator of how low our vaccination levels are in our communities. How low are they? And the likelihood that we will see other infectious diseases that we can vaccinate against. Measles is just, it's, it's obvious because, the vaccine because covers it's so more infectious. Than measles. Well, no, the measles, right. MMR does cover more than measles, but what I'm talking about is we have a whole array of childhood vaccinations. And I say a whole array, but really we're talking about a handful of vaccines, handful of tools to fight against thousands of pathogens out there. We can only touch on defending against a handful of them. You know, so measles, the MMR vaccine is protects against measles, mumps, and rubella, or what used to be called German measles. Um, and rubella being a, a problem for pregnant women, right, because we saw devastating impacts on their um, unborn children, the fetus, right? Um, mumps being a problem, as we've seen with our mumps outbreak um, in the past couple of years, uh, you know, in terms of the swelling and potential for, you know, um, sterility in males and females, um, as well as potential for other things, hearing impairment and uh, potentially encephalitis in the past. That's the one I was trying to think of. Yeah, so measles, measles can cause encephalitis. In fact, do you know George and the um, Giant Peach? Roald Dahl, the famous author, his, unfortunately his four-year-old daughter died from measles and she had measles encephalitis. She succumbed and died. It was, it, he wrote about it. It's extremely tragic. And she was healthy before she succumbed. We so have, it just shows that there is no rhyme or reason this, this virus well, we, can happen. The other really thing- we really got to stop it. I just want to add to is people don't realize that when you get measles infection, it also messes up your immune system in general. And there have been studies in the past to show that once someone recovers from measles, for some time afterwards, your immune system is not the same and you are, you're more vulnerable to infectious diseases in general than if you had not had measles. That's so, definitely going to be in the final exam. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you say to parents who are concerned about their children? getting autism mm -hmm. because of vaccines. Sure. There have been so many studies now to demonstrate that the safety of these vaccines. I know that some of the arguments that have been made in terms of additives and you know whatnot, I mean, think about the technology advances these days and that and compared with when these vaccines were first on the market. There is so far fewer less additives, if you will, in these vaccines than they were than there were when these vaccines were first made. On top of that, our technology is so precise that we can even limit to, it to a small amount of the protein that we put or the the weakened virus in this case that we put in the vaccine to just just enough to induce immunity, to teach your immune system how to fight off this infection. Whereas back in the day, there was loads more of um, protein or vir weakened virus or whatnot included in the vaccine. So even effect. all of us who were vaccinated in our day are probably got more additive, more of the um, what we call antigen in our vaccine that we receive than what the kids now are getting. It's if in a way it's a much cleaner vaccine. Yeah. But I would also encourage parents to talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your pediatrician, you know, Express your concerns, have that dialogue. I think, honestly, one of my concerns in Hawaii is that, um, unfortunately, our healthcare providers are weighed down with a lot of requirements, billing requirements and such, as, as our healthcare pro providers elsewhere. And so oftentimes, they're very much um, constrained about time limits with their patients when they really would love nothing better to spend as much time as possible talking to these parents. 
You know, and so a well, lot of times there is some, I will acknowledge, there are some limitations in terms of being able to do that. segue for the end of the show. We, we hate time limitations. Yes. We would like to spend all day with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think, I think we're out of time. So, Keisha, it's up to you to make some kind of final statement about this. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't envy you that. Ah. But uh, can you make a closing statement? And I certainly will. <laughs> and Sarah, if you disagree with anything she says, speak up. Okay? Sure. I would say the number one thing that a person can do to help themselves is to wash your produce. That is because of the rat lung worm disease. We know that if you wash your produce thoroughly, the same way we teach you to wash your hands to prevent the flu. If you do that, I think you would really help yourselves and the community. Also keep the area around your home clean. That way you can prevent rats who carry the germ or carry the worm who give it to the slugs mm -hmm. because the slugs eat the poop from the rats. Mm -hmm. uh, too technical for me. And it's also gross. But wash your <laughs> produce, wash your fruit. You don't need any special things to do this, any special chemicals. Just water, use your hands or even a brush. That will help with that. And then I would have to agree with the doctor. Get the vaccines for your kids. It's just that simple. It's much cleaner now. It's much healthier. And it helps us all. Do you agree? I would agree. Awesome. All right. Nice Jeez. job, Keisha. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Sarah. Thank you. It's great Thanks to have you down. Me. Thank you. You take care. Thanks. Aloha.